Welcome everyone. This program titled Ukraine as a microcosm of the urgent paradigm shift needed right now is a program that's dedicated to International Peace Day, September 21st. And we have here an extraordinary group of scientists and systemic system scientists and educators that are here to talk about alternatives that we do not hear in the public realm about the realities of Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, and uh, other options than continuing this war, which appears already to be um, moving into a very much dead-end situation. So we are very much hoping to enter into a conversation, a dialogue about what's possible, what are the alternatives that are not visible. But I'd like to start very briefly by in, uh, introducing our um, participants here, panelist members. We'll start with Dr. Rianne Eisler. Uh, Dr. Eisler is a social system scientist, cultural historian, futurist, and attorney whose research, writing, and speaking has transformed the lives of people worldwide and who is internationally known for her bestseller, The Chalice and the Blade, Our History, Our Future. Her newest work, Nurturing Our Humanity, How Domination and Partnership Shape Our Brains, Lives and Future, co-authored with anthropologist Douglas Fry, shows how to construct a more equitable, sustainable and less violent world based on partnership, rather than domination. Dr. Eisler is founder and president of the Center of Partnership Studies. She has addressed the United Nations General Assembly, the US Department of State and congressional briefings and has spoken at corporations and universities worldwide on applications of the partnership model introduced in her work. We also have with us Dr. Nina Lynn Meyerhoff, she is president and founder of Children of the Earth and has made a life of advocating for children and youth. She has received many awards for this work, from the Mother Teresa Award to the Citizen Department of Peace Award to the International Educators Award for Peace. Nina's focus is on the potentials of bringing ethical living skills into world consciousness. Some examples of her projects carried out in the pursuit of building a world of unity are establishing the first children's peace center in Ghana, fostering the building of schools in Nepal, a youth group's work on the Niger Delta, and her opus work now that unites all the pieces of her lifetime of service with inviting those with similar vision is establishing a city of hope one humanity institute adjacent to Auschwitz in order to illustrate and foster the transformation from hate to hope and from I to we to one. We also have with us Reverend Laura George, JD. She is a retired attorney and executive director of the educational charity, the Oracle Institute which advocates for peace at the nexus between religion, politics, human rights, and conscious evolution. Oracle Campus is the home of the Peace Pentagon, which is the US headquarters for the Earth Constitution Institute. We also have with us Dr. Scott Allen Carlin, who is a former professor of geography at Long Island University where he taught sustainable development. Dr. Carlin co-chaired the 66th United Nations Department of Global Communications NGO Conference in South Korea in 2016, entitled Education for Global Citizenship, Achieving the Sustainable Development Goals for All. He has served on the Global NGO Executive Committee, a voluntary board of elected NGO representatives to the UN. Dr. Carlin co-chaired the International Day of Education for Global Citizenship NGO Steering Committee until 2020. 
he co-authored The Role of Civil Society in Advancing Global Citizenship. And finally, a few words about myself, Dr. Lena Mustakova. I'm an evolutionary system scientist, educator, and psychologist, author most recently of Global Unitive Healing, and also co-founder of the Unitive Justice and Global Security Thought Leaders Synergy Circle. My clinical, educational, and community development work in the US and in Europe is focused on the evolution of consciousness as well as collective culture towards spiritual freedom and unity skills that can create a more just and compassionate, peaceful planet. My work on the ontogenesis of critical moral consciousness received major academic awards, and I'm also recipient of the 2004 Carter Campus Community Partnership Award. In a nutshell, I work as a bridge builder committed to unitive and consultative processes between groups as a way to steward the emergence of a peaceful planet. So we have here a very powerful group of system scientists and educators, and we have set for ourselves a particularly difficult task today. Rather than speaking about our individual work, we would like to bring our respective expertise to bear upon the war in Ukraine, which has entered its second year, has impacted much of the world, and despite the heroic victories of the Ukrainian people, it shows no signs of foreseeable resolution. So we would like to focus on two questions. First, how this war is in fact, or can be understood as a microcosm of everything that is wrong and unsustainable in our current global paradigm. And even though there's a lot to say there, this is not our primary focus, we just want to be clear about this. And then what we really want to focus on is what viable alternatives or specific changes in the global approach to this war, do we consider essential right now as part of the global ship needed in order to end this war? start with the first question now and we'll try to have each speaker make their contribution for more or less three minutes and so um, I'll start again with this first question and I'll turn to you Rianne first um, in your understanding how does this war represent a microcosm of everything that is wrong and unsustainable in our current global paradigm Vian. Dr. Well, Vian. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, well, from my perspective, uh, we have been living in a world for the last five to 10,000 years where violence, winners, losers uh, have taken it all. Our history has been written by them, uh, as we are beginning to find out here in the United States and in other parts are trying to uh, bring it more to what actually happened. Uh, I call this a domination system. And uh, it is simply not sustainable. And I think this war demonstrates this uh, by showing that violence begets more violence, that uh, the civilian casualties, the military casualties. Uh, and this really takes me to my work, uh, Elena, uh, which is a systems analysis of our past, our present, and the possibilities for our future. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we have, even in the countries that have democracy, uh, we have an uneasy mix between what I call a domination system and a partnership system. And in the world as it is constituted today, 
uh, violence uh, is the way, uh, as this war demonstrates, as the Mr. Putin's invasion of Ukraine uh, demonstrates, is the vehicle uh, that uh, people who want security, I mean, it isn't a question of goals. Uh, it is a question of worldview. And in the domination system, the worldview is that there is no partnership alternative. You either dominate or you are dominated. And that is what really has defined not only this war, but our economic system, uh, our family systems to a very large extent. Uh, now, the good news is that there are trends towards partnership, but we'll be talking about those uh, perhaps uh, in the next uh, installment. Thank you very much. That was profound. We already have a very strong start. This war is really not about goals. Dr. Eisler said it is about worldview. And in the world of domination, there is there can be no justice, there can be no partnership. So thank you. And with that, we'll go to Nina. Uh, Dr. Nina Meyerhoff, what would you like to say as a person who's dedicated your life to education? What do you see this war really being about? Well, I'd like to start to say that as we're evolving and consciousness is being available to all of us, uh, Ukraine began to look as a country of the new. It began to look like it was really seeking the values that we uh, assess as important, while Russia representing the old view and the clash between the new and the old versus bridging the process. So to begin with, I went to the border of Ukraine no, I, I was in Ukraine for Chernobyl and brought young people over to America at that time to check them for cancer, et cetera. But I was at the border now when the war started before all the organized NGOs were there. And the only people crossing the border were mothers and children. And what I discovered is 80% of women and Ukraine had not been professional women. So it was very difficult to cut families in half and have the women and children come to Poland, let's say. Uh, they never held a checkbook and they, they didn't go to jobs. They had little children, et cetera. So it was very difficult. So, and I've also now done several uh, Zooms and in person uh, meetings with Ukrainian young people and trying to understand what's living inside them and where is the hope that they can have a better life while they're going through all this trauma. Uh, and so what I'd like to say, oh, and I want to add that Zelensky gave a speech at the UN and at the UN he asked if Ukraine could house a peace room. In other words, before a war was established, could people come to the peace table and discuss the potential for what could emerge? And so myself and another person, Dr. Dot Maver, wrote him a letter of, of the peace resolutions that the NGOs had been working on for five or 10 years and said, but we never got an answer, but I understand it might've gotten lost in the melee of, uh, of things that have to be dealt with. So I would say that Ukraine originally was attempting to become the shining light of the future. And what was missing was the bridging of the old to the new. And we have that even in our positioning. We stand for this or we stand for that. Those are polarities. So thank you. That's what I want to say for now. Thank you. That was very powerful and probably information that many of our listeners would not have known that Ukraine was in fact aspiring to create a peace room and to really be a shining light for the future, as you said it, but how profound to realize the key need for transitioning. So this is very helpful. Thank you very much. 
Dr. Meerhoff. And now we come to Laura George, Reverend Laura George. What would you like to say about what you see in this microcosm? Well, nice to be here today with all of you. Um, I agree with both Rian and Nina. Um, what we're witnessing in Ukraine and in Russia is a battle of belief systems. Um, I don't know how many of the listeners are going to be familiar with the spectrum of consciousness. Um, but what's happening right now is that the, the first tier is collapsing. So we've got many humans on the planet who are in um, belief systems that still could be described as the dominator system um, who are going back in time and who are right now um, being attracted to authoritarianism. We know democracy has been on, on the decline for at least 15 years now. And then we have what we call it the Oracle Institute, new humans who are at the green meme, pluralistic, progressive, and who are excited to be moving into the future and following the evolutionary impulse. Um, at Oracle, we call that a God gap because we think um, actually all of this, your, your worldview stems from your view of deity and you operate in the world based on um, how you view the Godhead. So we break the world up into these five paradigms. And I think we're on the verge of going into a paradigm that would adopt what Rian calls partnerism. It would be a gender balanced deity and that would trickle down sort of our trickle down deity theory to a more civilized planet. Um, I just also wanted to mention that this, battle that we're witnessing um and i do agree that ukraine very much wants to move into the future and it's unfortunate that nato didn't include them um early enough um all of this would have been avoidable in my opinion but we've got to deal with the fact that there are still these dictators in the red meme the power meme and they're dinosaurs these guys are dinosaurs but they're still in power and I think the best way forward is for uh, democracy to progress as best it can in this atmosphere. And we're seeing the same challenges in the United States. And these are the things we're following at the Peace Pentagon. Thank you so much. And you are leaving us for now with a very important thought. Even though there is a lot of evolution towards what you call the green meme, there are also dictators, very real presence in the world. How do we handle that? And now we go to Dr. Scott Allen Carlin, and we want to put this reality that all of you described in the context of sustainability now. Dr. Carlin, what would you like to share with us? What do you Thank see you. the war in Ukraine illustrate? Yeah, so, so the core question here is, how is this war a microcosm of what we see that is wrong and unsustainable in our world paradigm? And my perspective on the war and our paradigm uh, begins with ecology. It begins with a sense of the way ecosystems function, particularly the interdependence that helps life to flourish. And in this unfortunate context of war, <clears throat> war divides us. Uh, there's a phrase that's used in war called the fog of war. So in the fog of war, it becomes harder to discern truth statements, what's up, what's down. And I think this is also true of our current world culture. We, we are in a time, and, and Laura, you expressed this very well in terms of the paradigm shift, uh, we're in a time where the traditional truth statements are becoming kind of destabilized and we're trying to find a new foundation for truth. So in, in Ukraine, it, it becomes very easy to kind of point a finger at one point of view or one power broker and say, that's where the problem is. Uh, but I want to remind us all of a powerful quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in a different context, a, a civil strife context, where he wrote, uh, sitting in the Birmingham jail, we are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality. 
tied in a single garment of destiny. And I think it's time now in, in this terrible uh, context of war for humanity to wake up to the, the deep and profound truth of what Dr. King expressed 60 years ago. This inescapable network of mutuality is who we are. Uh, and really the, the best expression of that is our capacity for love for each other. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, a lot has been offered already, and I'd, I'd like to try to build on what all of you said in my brief remarks about how I see Ukraine as a microcosm of everything that's really wrong with the world. Uh, I'll start with where Dr. Carlin ended, um, old truths do not correspond to the reality of ecosystems, to the reality of our oneness. And yet we live in global structure, which has absolutized national sovereignty. And if national sovereignty is an absolute value, then war, of course, is going to be a tool to protect national sovereignty. And so it is remarkable that in our evolution, we have uh, really evolved from families to, uh, um, to communities, to tribes, to nation states, to, uh, to city states, I'm sorry, to nations. And now we are so stuck at this stage of nations that it's really hard for us to see that the ecosystem that we all are really is governed by universal principles, unitary principles. And so our governance also needs to correspond to that. And I will also want to come back to uh, what Laura George offered, uh, a good reminder that even as our individual and collective consciousness is very rapidly evolving right now towards more unity of perspectives, Dictators are very real in the world, and we have no viable system to protect the human family and the planetary ecology from dictators. We have no supranational system that really has the capacity to enforce protection. To me, this kind of vacuum is very much illustrated in Ukraine, where aside from military industrial complex providing assistance to Ukraine and a lot of statements and, and, and talk, there's really no more serious alternative. There is a vacuum of authority. And the whole conversation around Ukraine is still a conversation about geopolitics and geopolitical strategic interests. It is not a conversation about principles of justice and integrity and the, the integrity of the ecosystem that we are and that Ukraine is very important to, as we've seen its impact in terms of hunger or food insufficiencies in the world, grain insufficiency. So this vacuum of authority beyond the nation state, to me is a very fundamental characteristic of this microcosm. We have global governance systems, but they are not really empowered to govern because national authority is still the sovereign. And so we cannot then be governed by principles, principles of partnership, principles of integrity, principles of uh, uh, care for the ecosystem because nations can choose different things. And so to me, the situation in Ukraine is very clearly bringing to us the need for rapid, urgent global restructuring. And I'll stop here uh, because probably as we move towards alternatives, that's where the conversation is going to become a lot more interesting. It is quite apparent uh, for now that this, this war also illustrates that human life continues to have very little value, actually, in the world in which we live, in the world of domination, as Dr. Eisler was very clear. So let's move now to 
what we see as viable alternatives to the dualistic conversation that has been in the public realm for or against. What are viable alternatives and what do we think they might look like practically in terms of a addressing this war um, in a way that addresses the urgency of this moment and really catapults the global shift that we are in the midst of. And again, I'll start here with Dr. Eisler. Um, Dr. Eisler, you have a lifetime of experience with the battle between these two systems and have, um, as uh, as has been known from, from your work, you have actually firsthand experience of the system of domination from which you had to flee in order to do your remarkable work in the world. So now on the other end of this process, this remarkable journey, can you say what you see might be a viable solution at this moment? Can you see such a thing? Well, thank you. Elena, uh, yes, I am a child refugee from the Holocaust. Um, and really, that was the impetus for my work, uh, asking the question of when we humans have such an enormous capacity for caring, for consciousness, for creativity, why has there been so much destructiveness, so much insensitivity, so much cruelty? Is there an alternative, or is it, as we are often told, just the way things are? And my work does show that there is an alternative. However, at this point in our history, uh, the nation state uh, is sort of the geopolitical unit, but it really goes down to uh, what Nina spoke about, what Laura spoke about, uh, to childhood, to gender, uh, to uh, four cornerstones. And I don't know of a shortcut, unfortunately, uh, for changes of consciousness. My latest book, which came out with, the, with Oxford University Press in 2019, draws very heavily from neuroscience and shows that this in-group versus out-group mentality uh, really and the denial, you know, whether it's COVID-19 denial or whether it's election a denial or whether it is uh, really denial of climate change, it doesn't matter. It really starts with the denial and the deflection to the quote out-group of the fear of the uh, anger that children experience when those on whom they depend for life, for shelter, for everything, uh, cannot turn that and confront those who are causing it in their families. Uh, and yes, the expression of God-fearing uh, really encapsulates the whole thing, that fear is what holds domination systems together. Fear, denial, uh, and in-group versus out-group thinking. Now, I wish that I could say that I see an immediate uh, solution to what's happening in Europe right now. But this inconceivable attack uh, in an area that we had considered really to be an area that would never engage in this. But there we are. But it's not the only war that's going on right now. I mean, Africa uh, is full of uh, violence and terror. Uh, Asia is on the brink of uh, I don't know what. Uh, you know, so I think that we have to strengthen the trends in our world that are happening, changes in how children are brought up. And I know this is a long-term thing. Uh, changes in what I call the hidden system of gendered values 
that actually uh, really governs our economic systems uh, where anything that's coded feminine, like caring, caregiving, you know, that caring connection, that yearning for mutuality that we all have uh, is really not funded. But prisons, you know, the punitive male head of household, who got money for that all the time, don't we? Or for wars. So we're talking about a shift in worldview. And it really starts with what Nina alluded to and Laura also alluded to, a change in story. And I think the story that we have to get out there through a multiplicity of campaigns is that there is another alternative that we have only for five to 10,000 years really lived in a system of domination of us against them, which is what this war is about. And that for millennia before that, uh, an ethos of caring uh, was more prevalent. And yes, it does mean elevating women. Uh, it means changing from punitive uh, child rearing. Uh, it really starts with what happens to our brains, uh, as neuroscience shows, in our early years, which is not genes, but gene expression. And that happens in interaction with our environments. So I think that in the short term campaigns, campaigns to educate people, that there is another alternative that can really sa satisfy our human need for caring connection and emphasize the positive. Um, and in the long run, the four cornerstones of childhood and family of gender, uh, of economics, because we are rewarding the wrong things, just as war is rewarded uh, with, you know, victory parades and loot and, you know, all of that stuff. Uh, we need to reward uh, those activities in the economic sphere that make for caring for people starting at birth and caring, as Scott so eloquently put it, caring for our natural life support systems. Uh, okay. So the, these are my thoughts. And as I said, I so wished that I had, you know, a magic wand to say this is the way. But in the short run, I think campaigns uh, to really educate people that there is another alternative, that it Things Thanks. are not just the way things are, but that we can move toward how not a perfect world, but not a completely violence free world even, but a much, much better world. Thank you very much, Dr. Eisler. That is profound food for thought for all of us, that uh, violence will not disappear suddenly, but as we learn an alternative, we can really learn to move further and further away from it in our educational approaches. Now, I'd like to turn to Laura George. Laura, I know you have worked for many years in the Earth Constitution movement, and uh, it would be very helpful for you to provide a structural perspective in terms of what might the Earth Constitution offer that could protect what Dr. Eisler spoke about, the campaign, the education, the gradual changing towards caring. Are there structures that the Earth Constitution can offer that could actually support this process? Uh, yes, I believe there are. Um, first though, let us acknowledge that the United Nations is paralyzed, um, that it's a non-democratic body, and that the Security Council has permanent members, such as Russia, one of the countries we're discussing today, which prevent it from prevents it from um, having any authority regarding war. Countries are only volunteering, voluntarily submitting to jurisdiction at the World Court. So we don't have a global government yet. Um, 
one of the good things UN has done though, and I want to, this ties back to what Rian was just talking about, is put up front and center that the elevation of women and the empowerment of women and the economic uh, advancement of women is key to this shift. So I want to underscore that before I even talk about the Earth Constitution, because this ties back in with our God gap theory. We've got, um, you know, we've had 2000 years of patriarchy on the planet and patriarchy is feeding these wars. There's no doubt about it. So the spiritual shift and the elevation of women are actually, are absolutely key. So after World War I, um, the peace movement was actually at its strongest. That's when the Kellogg-Briand Pact was passed. And almost every nation on the planet has signed this international treaty of peace, which they're now all violating. The next stage was the UN, uh, the League of Nations and the UN. And when it became apparent that the United Nations was not going to have the authority and power to protect the planet, uh, the, to my, in my mind, the two major things we need global governance for are one war, but also uh, protecting the planet itself, sustainability and, and ecology. We, those two goals cannot be done in a nation state basis. We can't reach consensus um, without, a, without this federation of nations. So after it became obvious that the United Nations wasn't going to be able to handle uh the requirements of, of future global governance. Uh, uh, many scholars peeled off, jurists from all over the uh, country peeled off, and they started drafting the Earth Constitution. It took about 30 years for this uh, very incredible group, um, very esteemed group of academics to finish. Uh, they considered it finished in 1991. So since 1991, we've had this incredible document called the Earth Constitution. Um, as an attorney, I am completely enamored with it. Just to give you some of the simple structure, they divided the planet into 10 zones. So there's 10 districts. So I'm going to compare it to how we do our governance in the United States. So there are, there's a house of the people, house of the people. So that's similar to our uh, House of Representatives. And that's where the 10 divisions come in on the planet. Then there are uh, the House of the Nation. So that's sort of like our Senate. So every country still gets to send a representative. Then they added an ingenious uh, body called the House of the Counselors. And this was, uh, this is designed to bring in the academics from major universities and also indigenous wisdom keepers. So they have this other body that most countries don't have, a House of Counselors. And then of course there's a world judiciary um, and here's another interesting aspect of the Earth Constitution. There's not one president of the planet. As I like to say, this is Team Light's version of globalization. So under the Earth Constitution, there's a presidium. It's a five-year term. There's five presidents. It rotates in, so you're not losing any of the brain trust that's developed. And the executive is exceedingly limited in its powers. So can't declare war, number one. <laughs> um but anyway, so it's a it's a really beautiful design. Um, and yes, we're proud to be both a sponsor of the Earth Constitution and the U.S. headquarters for the movement. I just want to add there are also other uh, Earth Constitutions out there. Um, my good friend Anna Lou Smitsman is designing the Earth Wise Constitution. So I see her project as a bottom up attempt to bring more people into the process because the earth constitution is now a top-down approach because it's completed i mean it can be amended of course but i think both of these approaches are uh both necessary and will help us arrive at a holistic global governance and the last thing i want to mention is that um we also need to uh bring in those who are separated in all these organizations we've got thousands and thousands of peace groups and it's time to not just confederate the planet but, con but get these peace groups to join together and get behind uh, a movement so that we can have a wave of enthusiasm and energy the way they did after world war one and world war ii thank you laura this was uh, quite the vision that you gave us so profound and so inspiring and it's really uh, so thought provoking that we have this blueprint 
that's been created by thousands of people over decades that is a clearly much more viable alternative that very few people relatively on the planet know about and that is not really part of the conversation now, even as we're running out of resources for real solutions. So this is very profound. Thank you very much. So uh, we now want to move to Nina. Uh, Dr. Meerhoff, you have uh, done so much public education all of your life. What do you think might be particularly helpful right now in turning the tide from thinking war to laying the groundwork for collectively worked out peace. Well, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak on education. Uh, I've been working on holistic education. I was sort of the grandmother of it. Plus, prior to that, the children's rights movement, now the HOLO education movement. And what I see is that education, even though it's not integrated into our old established industrial model, you know, we need to move forward, at least conceptually. And I would say now uh, there are a group of educators already thinking about how can we help further the understanding that we're interdependent, interconnected, really almost all one, and that what happens to you happens to me. How, how do you create curriculum around that? And I've been working on that. I'm writing a chapter now for a book on it. But the, the point being that I really think it's the individual, and that's why I've always worked with young people or given my energy to that, was because they are the future. In other words, in 10 years, they are our leaders. And the most important thing we can say to them is do not imitate or continue what we have done. Let's look at what you see as possible and who are you in relationship to this? How can you build a work that works for you and others? And then we discover we're all the same. We're one. And the differences are like clothing upon a person, our culture, our gender identity, our country, you know, and, and I am also, because uh, I heard you, a child of a Holocaust survivor. And I think it's a very important experience in life because it shows you the horrors of what can exist when humanity exterminates humanity, you know, systematically. Well, we have to systematically increase love in the world. And how do you increase love in the world? You have to really work with the individuals and the individuals collectively will stand for that. And I have great hope for the future because I see Breakdown is opportunity for breakthrough and things are falling apart everywhere, you know, and young people see it. They know it and they're not going to stand for it anymore. They really have a different vision of what the world can be. And we need to encourage this as much as possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nina. This is really profound and very hopeful that the young people see the possibility of breakthrough in this breakdown. And that's what we can support and encourage. And uh, we now want to go to uh, Scott. And maybe you could talk to us from the perspective of ecosystems. What specific urgent shifts you would like to see that may somehow help us resolve this crisis as we're also lagging so far behind on sustainable development goals. Thank you. I want to return to the theme of consciousness because it is something in each of our control and it's in how we talk to each other, how we relate to peers, how we interact with professionals in our professional life, how we raise our children. <clears throat> and it's important for us to be mindful that we do have the power to stop funding violence. Um, this may not seem credible that the small acts we take and how we spend our money are going to matter, but they do matter at the very least at the level of consciousness. 
particularly when we are you know, able to express this verbally to each other. I am a conduit of peace. I am a conduit of love. I reject the idea that Ukraine has to be mired in, in war. So we have to find ways to stop funding violence individually and especially collectively. We have to stop funding these systems of dominance that Rihanna has helped us to understand. And we have to also understand that the economic systems of the world are also violent. Uh, on the theme of ecology, the biodiversity of the world, we are at war with nature. We are exterminating life on the planet. Um, this is a, a profound moment, this biodiversity crisis. It is our economic system. It is our broader culture. It is our education system, as Nina just expressed that is all contributing to this. So I, I am a conduit of love. I am a conduit of helping to heal nature. I will be out working with others to heal nature. We will come up with a plan. Um, back to um, Ukraine, the military budgets that are driving war, we have to end these military budgets. Again, this is first and foremost an act of conscience and then an act of you know, verbal expression and solidarity. The military budgets are signs of success in our current warped culture. We have to begin to question those values. We have to begin to see military budgets not as signs of success, but of signs of failure. We all want to live in a world of peace and the size of our military budgets are a clear indicator we are not yet adequately on that path to peace. The war in Ukraine is itself a sign of failure, that we are not succeeding in working together. Um, the book of Isaiah says, nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. I don't know why in the year 2023, we can't just declare victory <laughs> and put an end to war, please. In his quite profound encyclical, Laudato Si, Pope Francis talked about integral ecology, the ecologies of nature and the social ecologies, and the integral ecology that all of these are interwoven with each other. So let's get to work on, on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, another very, very profound call with very clear parameters. Um, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to integrate all the profound points that have been offered. So we may or may not be quite able to do that. And now I'd like to add my thoughts and then uh, perhaps our integration will be a collective effort at the end. Um, like Dr. Eisler and also like Dr. Meyerhoff, I also am very much moved in my personal, professional, and global work by my personal experience. I spent 29 years growing up in a totalitarian regime in fear every day and every night that they will come and get me or my parents, and I will never see them again. And I have family and friends who never came back. So to me, this is very and much as I do not believe in a culture of war, I also do believe that we have to have a system to stop dictators because I've lived way too close to the regime of people like Mr. Putin to take it lightly. And so when I think about what what are the kind of changes that I'm hoping to see at this moment? They start from the individual level, and that is work that I first did once I was able to escape the totalitarian regime. That was work on the ontogenesis of, of critical moral consciousness in the individual. That is the consciousness shift of each one of us. And I do believe that education is a very, very powerful tool, and we've heard some profound suggestions here already. So I, I won't come back to that. 
although this is the work of changing, of transforming consciousness, of, of changing mindsets. And I am very acutely aware how in the former Eastern Europe, there are still very strong mindsets from that particular time of 50 years of totalitarian regimes. And these mindsets themselves are reproducing um, the possibility for war, which made me leave the United States and go back to Eastern Europe to try to work with these mindsets in the last part of my professional and personal journey, uh, hopefully. So yes, the individual transformation, but also the cultural transformation of mindsets that all of you have spoken eloquently about. I want to take it also to the level of community. We have at least two historical examples worldwide of truth and reconciliation processes that work. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why this conversation is not part of the global discussion right now. The truth and reconciliation process that both um, Ukrainian people and Russian people want. Who are the entities that can protect and open space for such a process? These are questions we have to ask. These are questions that have to become public. That's what I'd like to see. I heard from somebody coming back from Rwanda just very recently and from a country of a massive recent genocide. It is now a country where you cannot even import plastics through the airport. That is the amount of healing and transformation and thinking about themselves as an ecosystem that they have achieved in just a few decades. How did that become possible? Are we learning from this example? Is that example being brought to the conversation with Ukraine? So that is on the community and national level. And then I also have to speak about the global systems level. As a uh, developmental and evolutionary psychologist, I know that the change in consciousness and mindsets and culture is a very gradual process. And so it has to be protected. There has to be, there have to be agencies that provide enough peace and security that this process of the growth of this new worldview can take root. That takes time. And so my understanding is that since the middle of the 19th century, the governing spiritual principles for our age, and that is my understanding from my own spiritual background, are the principles of unity and justice. And that we actually have to have entities that are able to protect unity and justice. Why? Because it is not possible to really achieve unity without working for justice. And at the same time, it is not possible to achieve sustainable justice from a place of disunity. And so it's a very complex dialectic between unity and justice and, and um, creating entities that protect open space for unity justice. There has been a proposal released into the world that instead of this warped national cultures that pride on the military budgets, the world should have only one military budget, only one force that is only existing for the purpose of stopping dictators. It is not existing for any other executive uh, decisions. Um, and that is a very powerful suggestion that has existed since the middle of the 19th century. And we seem to be moving in that direction, but in a very uh, warped old world frame of reference. It can't be NATO and it can't be the worldview of NATO. And so uh, to me on the systemic, systemic level, we need to indeed work with what um, Scott, you said. We need to see cultures and nations stop supporting national military budgets but also everyone contributing to a collective budget, military budget and a collective force that does have the power to protect spaces where truth and reconciliation and healing and processes of caring and partnering and finding new solutions can really take root. And with this, um, I will stop.
it is clear that we really cannot exhaust this profound topic. It offers so much. Uh, but as we are coming to an end of today's program, I'd like to give each of our illustrious speakers today the opportunity for a final word. Um, for today, not a final word. <laughs> Uh, in in the general sense, but just in terms of today's program, just a closing thought. And let's start again with Dr. Eisler. Well, we have shared our hopes and our dreams and some actions. And I think that it really does come down to the spiritual realm, to the realm of worldview. And for me, uh, spirituality is putting love into action. Uh, that may sound simple, but uh, we know that we have actually uh, have been shifting from this conquest of nature, of other people, uh, of control over others, uh, power to, power with, rather than power over, are in the air. So I would say that anything that all of us can do to do this, uh, whether it is in our personal conversations, in our own sphere of influence, whether it is working with groups. Um, I love the idea, and I think it was Laura who brought it up about the peace groups, just working together uh, on you know, rather than being completely uh, everybody for themselves, because believe me, those pushing us back towards a dictatorship, towards violence, uh, internal and external, uh, they have a unified agenda. Putin in uh, 2018 actually lowered the penalty for family violence. That's right. So that if you hurt or kill a child or a woman or a man in your family, the penalty is less than if you kill or hurt a stranger. Why? Because Putin gets it. The people pushing us back get it. In the United States, so much focus is on family, on gender. Uh, we have to learn from the people who are pushing us back because they have a unified domination agenda. And Thanks. I really yeah. think we can do it, but uh, it requires us to work together, unity and Thank justice. You. This is very profound and clearly not uh, something that we can stop discussing. We just have to wrap it up for today. But it's very powerful because we need to be as united as is the old world that is holding on tight. So I'm going to turn now to Dr. Nina Meyerhoff for closing words. Nina, what would you like to leave us with? Yeah, I was thinking uh, that in a way Ukraine now is a, somewhat of a disappointment to many of us because it could have been leading the way towards the light if you were to put it. And there was uh, many of us that were looking at it that way. And we need to help Ukraine remember that they wanted originally to go to the peace table. And that's where we need to go to have dialogue and begin to really unravel how do we move from hate to hope. That is that is very powerful. Help Ukraine remember. I think that will be a theme that will really emerge from, from today's conversation. Thank you, Dr. Meerhoff. Reverend Laura George, closing thoughts. I'm going to leave you with, with this statement that when the Godhead shifts, so does the paradigm. Yeah. So this merger of science and spirituality, which is happening right now, is giving us not only new science and new spirituality, but new stories, new archetypes. And again, I believe women are the key to the shift. I couldn't agree with 3N more. Um, authoritarians know part of the playbook is to disempower women. That's what we're watching. 
So what we need is a spiritual movement. There's a reason why Gandhi was so successful and Martin Luther King Jr. was so successful. They brought their spirituality into the movement. So I just want to underscore that. Um, And I guess my last thought is that in addition to a global women's movement, we do need a global peace movement. And I think if both were happening simultaneously, Team Light would uh, win the trajectory. Thank you. Thank you very much. To be continued. Uh, Closing thoughts, Dr. Scott Carlin. What a wonderful event this has been. So thank you, everybody, for for your contributions. I want to close by just saying how powerful and profound education has been in my life. Um, My passion is for educating, and education is the way forward. Men do have to step forward. Laura, you have my full support. Let the women lead. Uh, and we do need to you know, work together so that men and women recognize this powerful leadership role that, that women are called for at this moment. And just one last final point. Uh, one more quote from Rachel Carson, again, way back when, 1962, writing about if we're going to live so intimately with pesticide chemicals like DDT, we better know something about their nature and power. I'd like to paraphrase that and say, if we're going to live so intimately with Russia and Ukraine and all the nations of the world, we had better know a lot more about their nature and their power. So I'm really um, attracted to this idea of the kind of dance between intimacy and materiality that can spur us all forward. Thank you, thank you. This has really been an extraordinary meeting. And um, I would just like to offer as my closing thought that indeed, this is a profound process of spiritual transformation. And to my knowledge, from at least the middle of the 19th century, the understanding of the Godhead as not gendered, but truly unknowable has already been released into the world. And that this understanding in fact invites humanity to discover and approach the unknowable nature of this Godhead by discovering processes of unitive justice. So it is a spiritual upheaval that we're in the middle of, and uh, I hope that this conversation can continue and go forward. I want to thank you all very, very much. And uh, I believe we're leaving our listeners with a lot of food for thought and further discussion. Thank you. Thank you.